You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis. I'm your host for BioTalk. And as you know, we talk to leaders and people who are very interested in the biohealth capital region and building our ecosystem. And we have a very important contributor to that, someone that a lot of our companies would like to get to know very well, because anybody that has connections to capital is always a very important person and popular person on Biotalk. So we have Brett Shealy, who's the executive director for life sciences for JP Morgan Chase, which for most of you or a lot of your listeners know that JP Morgan is one of the big dogs in the life science and the biotech industry. And of course, they have their major JP Morgan conference in San Francisco every January. So we're really fortunate to have Brett with us today because he's going to introduce himself uh, since he's actually replacing someone which we worked with very closely, Christian Barrow, over a year ago, or uh, and who's now in Canada. And we're really fortunate to have somebody that's a local uh, representing JP Morgan with us. So Brett, welcome to Biotalk. Thank you, Rich. Very excited to be here. And you know, what we normally do, Brett, is no one knows you better than you. So we're going to let you do a little self-introduction for our listeners to talk about everything you feel that they would like to know about Brett. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, Rich. Glad to be here and to uh, dive in. Um, I guess I'll start a little a little far back. You know, after after undergrad, I started my career um, actually locally in the biohealth uh, region with a small consulting firm, you know, managing projects, you know, where a few of our largest projects were actually at the, uh, a few of the institutes at NIH. So, you know, not a scientist by any means, but uh, got exposed to some of the interesting research. Uh, went back to grad school, completed an MBA, married my wife, didn't have an op- opportunity to uh, move out to San Francisco, California, and join the you know, early stage life sciences and healthcare banking team at Wells Fargo. Um, that's where I started to really dig into the industry, specializing in the space. Great team there. Um, and after a few years, I had an opportunity to join uh, J.P. Morgan's life sciences banking practice and 2017, you know, and, and of course was certainly attracted to the opportunity given the you know significant focus on and uh, resources dedicated to the healthcare space in general, you know, from supporting early stage companies up through global expansion, you know, capital markets uh, through our healthcare investment banking team. Um, my wife and I had three kids while we were in California, so we have three, five, and under today. Um, exciting times. Uh, last summer, had the opportunity to migrate back to the East Coast, and uh, have been you know loved being back in the region since. And when you say migrate back to the East Coast, you might let the listeners know basically where it is on the East Coast. I live here in Maryland. How about that? Yeah, yeah. that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's nice to have uh, you know big time investment bankers located right in our region because when Chris would come down, he'd commute down and really. Uh, office a lot out of the Philadelphia area. And, uh, but it's really nice to have a JP Morgan representative in our backyard. So welcome to the biohealth capital region, Brett. Absolutely. What I'd like to do is a lot of people uh, have this mystique about investment banking and there's many different aspects to it. And JP Morgan's involved in all of it. Why don't you talk a little bit about what your current role with JP Morgan is and uh, sort of some of the things you do in your daily activities that would be interesting to our listeners. Yeah, you know, my role, um, you know, as you work with Christian Barrow, you know, I pick up on his, on his coverage, but, you know, I currently, my role is currently to, to lead the uh, Mid-Atlantic on the life sciences banking practice on the corporate banking side. You know, so I cover everything from Pennsylvania, Delaware, down through Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Um, you know, my role is very relationship-focused, getting to uh, know the management teams, um, in the life sciences industries from an early stage and you know, getting to know them, getting to know their milestones and really just staying close and being able to support them where JP Morgan can be um, a value added resource. My focus and of course, what I enjoy the most is really contributing and building the ecosystem, you know, as, as part of that process where we're really digging here with in biohealth where that comes in. So anyway, I can uh, contribute to that ecosystem is, is where I enjoy um, spending much of my time, 
but uh, also getting out and communicating with, with management teams as well. And let's talk a little bit about the services that your division, the life science division of JP Morgan is directly involved in. When, when you call on companies, what is it that you can bring to those companies from financial services? Yeah, I think there's a lot to talk about there. Um, obviously, you know, we can certainly uh, bring broader JP Morgan resources, but really want to, at an early stage, get them set up on our platform, be able to support them operationally on their banking side, and then have those more strategic discussions on financing, debt, equity, looping in our healthcare investment banking partners. And uh, even on our, our private bank, we have a very focused healthcare team that loves to support the executives of the uh companies that we talk to. So really trying to bring the full capabilities and platform behind us uh, to the companies, again, from you know, early stage operational setup all the way through you know, international expansion and to you know, accessing the uh, capital markets. And then let's talk a little bit about at what stage does a company really qualify to be a client? Other than just getting into your system, when is it do you believe that they're ready for a transaction or some type of an event to occur where JP Morgan would take an active role? Yeah, I think that's a good question and very relevant. I'm glad you asked, Rich, because perhaps five years ago or so, a lot of the folks I would talk to would say, hey, come back and talk to me when we're thinking about the M&A or the IPO or we're too small for JP Morgan. But there's certainly, again, a lot of resources that I mentioned and focus has been um, spent in building those relationships with companies from an, the earliest stage possible. So a lot of times we're, we're starting those relationships on the operating side from inception, you know, up through research and development, commercialization, again, up to those capital markets. But I think there's a conversation to be had throughout that process, whether it's, you know, helping them expand efficiently or, uh, you know, at, at the point where it's relevant and makes sense really to have those strategic discussions for a potential transaction. So I guess from a customer relationship management standpoint, it's never too early for you to meet somebody, but it, you know, it might be too early for a transaction, but uh, unless you get involved early with that company and watch them grow, then you might not be in a position to help them when they're in that stage when they need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Although, you know, perhaps most many of our companies are early stage and will not see revenue for a number of years. There's many ways we can support them throughout that growth. And then we have a broad definition of biohealth, which, uh, and you're, you know, using the term life sciences at JP Morgan. How common are they? Because we include, you know, pharma, biomedical device, biomarkers, tools, digital health, also looking at uh, vaccines, diagnostics, AI, machine learning, quantum as it would relate to healthcare. How does that parallel with your definition of life sciences at JP Morgan? Sure. Yeah, we define life sciences as, you know, pharmaceuticals, biotech, medical devices, med, med technology, diagnostics, um, CROs and CDMOs. Okay, so you actually would get, yeah, CDMOs and CROs. So you, you also would get into the service side of life sciences as well as sort of the product side. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, we've had a very interesting climate uh, in the financial markets over the last 18 months or more. 2021 for the biohealth capital region was a banner year in almost all respects, IPOs, venture capital, um, you know, seed financings, angel financings, everything was just alive. 22 looks a little different right now, but I'd like to get from your JP Morgan perspective, which tracks the industry throughout the United States, what is the current climate that JP Morgan sees where we are today? Uh, and really, what do we see for the rest of this year in 2022? Then we'll talk about beyond that later. Yeah, I'd say in general, it's hard to beat the last two years as far as the uh, activity and the successes and the uh, access to capital. This year, I think everybody's very aware that the public market um, has been challenging. And so the activity that we've seen on that side is, has been very limited. I will say the public market has, uh, has had a decent rally since mid-June with a small to mid-cap index up as well. So uh, we're seeing a little bit of a uh, uptick there. Not, not, not saying I'm calling the uh, bottom yet, but uh, it's good to see that uh, that's kind of slightly coming back up. You know, small mid cap public companies that really access the public markets over 21. Certainly, that cohort has experienced an outsized impact in growth to value rotation. 
you know, especially when you're comparing it to the larger cap biotech or just, just the broader S&P in general with many of those really tracking below issuance. And, uh, but they're, you know, beginning to see a bounce back. Uh, you know, the market still has, you know, faces several headwinds, whether it's macro drivers, you know, inflation, energy prices, political tensions through high cash burn rates and you know, limited M&A activity. So hoping to see an uptick there. The IPOs, after several months of robust issuance, they've definitely slowed. Pricing outcomes uh, throughout this year have been mixed. I have to give a shout out to the local Ar- Arcelex for, you know, they have a, have a successful IPO and they're performing above issuance. So that's great to see. You know, what else? Outlook, I'd say over the next next few months, I think we'll see a few IPO deals that could test the market post Labor Day. You know, second quarter of uh, of any years is mostly kind of quiet on the uh, on the IPO market. So hoping to see, given this uptick in the market, that you know um, a, a few companies kind of test the waters, see how that kind of plays out. And it's really important to for these companies to kind of start their size conservatively, conservatively, and then uh, upsize based on the strength of that uh, case. So you know, on the VC side, you know, the biopharma medtech continues to see declines across all sectors this year. VC numbers are really back down to say 2019 levels. Uh, so not as robust as the prior t- two years, but you know still decent over recent history. So that's that's good to see. Um, we've seen you know early stage seed and Series A financings seem to be stronger in the first half of of this year. You know with the later rounds, you know subsequent to that, really being the ones that are taking a hit and are in the in the tightest spot. You know we see a, a decline for the rest of the 2022 with fewer and, and lower dollar financings on a more selective basis that are more focused on platform technologies and really good science. Uh, this also can be a driver in, in seeing potentially more private investments in public companies and also later stage investment rounds on the private side versus ac- accessing the, uh, the public markets. You know, just a few other thoughts on the, the M&A side. You know, the fact is that there's a large number of, of these companies that... Uh, you know, need significant capital to uh, achieve their long-term growth plans, of course. But there's many of those companies out there that have less than 18 months of cash runway. And so, you know, and, and, and a majority of those have a valuation of, you know, less than 1 billion or so. So we're, we're expecting to see either throughout the rest of this year or early next year, kind of the uptick in M&A activity. And I think that will certainly, as, uh, as we anticipate, have a little spark to, to, the, uh, to the market in general. Thanks for that. That's a great overview, Brett. And uh, you mentioned a couple of things I want to drill down a little bit on. One, you mentioned the word valuation. And what I'm hearing or sensing is that whether it's the VC portfolios or the public market portfolios, valuations tend to be down right now. And do you look at that as a good buying opportunity or an investment opportunity uh, for people that are looking at this uh, life science sector at this particular point in time, because we know, as, as you've said, there's uh, a lot of these companies don't have the runway that they need to, but you know, these entrepreneurs are going to have a challenge based on, do they take the money in at a lower valuation or do they do a smaller bridge to get them to the point where valuations might uptick again? It's, it's really tough to be a CEO in an emerging company that doesn't have all the capital they need at this particular point in time. Yeah, I think you're right on, uh, Rich, and uh, I think that's much of the dynamic that's been going on, and perhaps what's you know partly contributing to kind of the lower uh, number of of deals this year is kind of that dynamic and negotiation between companies either last valuation trying to meet their next round and what that valuation might look like versus what investors uh, anticipate and what they're seeing kind of bringing down from the from the public market as well. So. Yeah, we certainly see that, as I mentioned, hit some of the the later rounds as those is certainly I think the ones that are in the worst spot were the ones that were looking for that uptick in in valuation into the into the capital markets, but are looking at other alternatives. But, uh, you know, on earlier stage seed and and series A, those valuations have not seen as much effect from that uh, environment, uh, you know, to date, but that may start to adjust as well. And then, you know, you've been really talking about it from a national perspective. Let's look at really uh, Maryland, D.C. and Virginia in our backyard and your mid-Atlantic area. So how is the mid-Atlantic area faring compared to the rest of the United States? And especially, 
everybody uses uh, Boston and New York as the benchmark areas. And how's Mid-Atlantic doing against Boston and New York and San Francisco right now? Yeah, I think those three areas, Boston, New York, and, and, of, and of course, you know, San Francisco are, are still um, you know, raising capital. And, uh, you know, those are also close to a lot of the investors. And so, you know, I think the, the Mid-Atlantic region continues to, to raise capital as well. I think there's a few um, solid companies that we've seen on the map that are, have been successful. But I think it's challenging for everybody all around. So whether we're here or we're, we're there, you know, I think it's, it's still hitting that same environment that we're seeing on a, on a national basis. But, you know, where, where that technology that's differentiated is, is to, to be had and where a good story is to be told, I think uh, those, those companies are, are continuing to be successful. Yeah. And one last thing about this challenging time. Do you, do you believe that the investors, I mean, there's tons of money sitting on the sidelines right now. So, I mean, there's, uh, but what I'm, you know, I'm hearing is taking a little longer to get a deal done. Uh, people may be waiting for them to get a little further along clinically than where they may have been before to try to reduce risk. But yet at the same time, if you have that phenomena, then also valuations are going to potentially go up. So for the people, I mean, as an investor, you have to weigh, do we get in a little earlier, take a little higher risk, or do we try to downsize the risk by getting involved at a later stage, but then potentially miss out on a deal? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the the, the VCs uh, continue to raise funds, LPs continue to invest. So you know, I think the industry is flush with cash out there and it's just a matter of that needing to be deployed, which, which it does. And just the timing factor, again, I think it's uh, just seeing how things play out with the market, um, negotiations between expectations and management teams and the investors, valuations, but also, you know, de-risking your investments, um, structuring that, that capital a little more than perhaps you would have um, deploying smaller deals across a few different companies. So I think that's what we'll continue to see um, through the rest of this year. Well, I think we've got a great litmus test coming up here right in September 20th and 21st. We're going to have uh, the BioHealth Capital Region Forum, the eighth annual one, which will be at U.S. Pharmacopoeia in uh, Twinbrook over in Rockville. And uh, it's going to be in person for the first time in three years. JP Morgan is going to be a sponsor. So thank you for your sponsorship for that event. Also, something that you're going to be more active in is on the 21st will be the fifth annual BioHealth Capital Region Investment Conference, where we match investors who have money and companies looking for money, where they can set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with one another. Uh, and right now we have about 62 investors. So we're really seeing a lot of interest, more interest than we've ever had over the last seven, eight years from investors looking for good deal flow. And we're still trying to prop up uh, the number of companies that these investors can look at. We're sitting around 70 to 75 companies. We want to get to 100. So I guess from your perspective, having these one-on-one -on -one meetings with investors and companies right in our own backyard, getting a lot of investors that have never been here before to look at deals can only help what we're trying to do in this biohealth capital region, Brad. Absolutely. I think it would only be beneficial. And I'm very excited to, to participate this year, both in the, in the crab chat, but also the forum on the two-day event. Um, I think it'll be great for the community, the companies that attend, as well as the investors to get to get uh, exposed to some of the, the companies that'll, that'll be there. And it'll also be good to just get a pulse on, uh, on the, on the, the uh, VC environment as well. Updates there, how these VCs are thinking about their investments um, and kind of... Uh, you know, talking to them more. So very excited. I've enjoyed uh, participating in the, in the organization of this as well, working with, with the strong partners in the region that are joining in to uh, build up the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, I think it's just a matter of continuing that uh, display of the local, you know, talent, the local technology and uh, what's being built here. So certainly looking forward to it. So we're going to have a lot of different types of investors. We'll have VCs. We'll have actually angels, high net worth individuals. We'll have some family offices. There'll be some investment banks. There's actually going to be some strategic partners. But from a JP Morgan perspective, with the companies that would be registering to apply for this thing, what are the primary things you would look to that for companies that you'd like to set up a meeting with? What would be the attributes or criteria that they would need to have to get your interest? Yeah, you know, I think it always starts with um, you know good management teams, good founders. Uh, then that kind of really leads into interesting technology. Where does the technology come from? Um, how are you positioning it in, in the market? You know, at longer long term, what's the development plan? 
Um, are you able to communicate that plan? I think folks that are attending, um, you know, should prepare that story, have that uh, pitch deck put together. But uh, you know, love to, you know, how is that differentiated from from what's out there? And these are the types of companies that we'd certainly want to talk to. If you look at the different niches, industry niches within the life science industry, whether it be pharma, bio, CAR T cell therapy, vaccines, you mentioned CDMOs, biomanufacturing, are there hot areas that you're seeing from an investment climate right now that people are paying particular attention to? Yeah, I think a lot of the investment dollars uh, these days are really going into uh, differentiated platforms. Cell and gene therapies obviously have been very attractive for investors um, given the impact there. Uh, we've also seen a lot of dollars going into uh, CDMOs that are able to manufacture these complex processes to, to support these cell and gene therapies. So those are all you know, interesting space. But you know, that's not to say that other, other areas aren't differentiated or can bring something out to the, to the community as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm hearing interest from, you know, a couple of the investors who are really interested in that CDMO market. And I hadn't heard about that, you know, 18 months ago, but everything runs in cycles. But right now, CDMO seems to be a hot ticket. It's very interesting. And I'd say very, very much of a need. Um, It's not easy to to manufacture there. So those that can uh, pull together the resources and be able to accommodate the industry, I think will, will be very, very interesting. And since, you know, you've had some experience in this market, but if you, if you really look at the transformation of where this used to be 15 years ago to where it is today, it was primarily an R&D and a basic research market and actually has become more of a commercial market. So there's a greater need for manufacturing expertise, marketing and sales expertise in the commercialization side in our market today versus where it used to be, where it was almost all R&D and basic research. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of one big question I wanted to ask you, Rich, is really how have you seen the BioHealth Capital Forum, this event, uh, really evolve over the years? I know you've been doing it for a number of years. Well, that's nice to turn the tables on me, Brett. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so, so, I mean, the key is, is that if we really look at the complexion of this, this market here right now, of course, we always gauge ourselves based on the genetic engineering news, biohealth uh top 10 report, cluster report, where we decided we wanted to be a top three by 2023, which is next year. Got some work to do. But, you know, if you really look at the transformation of this region, first of all, it's always been strong in research and development dollars. I mean, we're like the second largest NIH funded region in the country right now. And unless you get those you know, the government dollars, which are non-dilutive to support these early stage companies, that's a very critical component. So that's one of our strongest assets. And I think that's continued to grow. Wet lab space was a challenge in the past, but if you look at the evolution over the last five to seven years, we're like third in the country with wet lab space. Unfortunately, though, I just saw a report at Washington, D.C. from one of the developers said we have 1.3% vacancy. Montgomery County's got about 4% vacancy right now. So if you're looking at one and a half to 4% vacancy, it's basically virtually you, you're really full. And, you know, if you had a company that needed two or 300,000 square feet, that's not there, you might lose them to another region. So that's going to be another challenge, but I think there's more spec space starting to evolve uh, where people weren't willing to take the risk before. And then you have uh, conversion office space conversions to lab space, which is transforming in our marketplace so that's that, that's a healthy dynamic and trend. Another report that just came out showed that we basically are second in uh, life science talent in the United States. You know, that's somewhat obvious with the quality of the academic institutions, having the FDA, the National Institute of Health, HHS and all of those policy people here in our backyard. We really have, uh, you know, I wouldn't say an abundance, but we generally can meet almost anybody's needs, uh, you know, from a talent perspective. The two areas that we're still working on, I think, to strengthen, uh, one is jobs. But when you look at uh, companies that have selected this region, like Kite, who had not been here in the past, Vaxi Tech, which is a public company, you probably followed a little bit. They bought a company, Avidia, down in Baltimore. They're starting to grow their footprint here. You know, Horizon Therapeutics, which bought Viella Bio out of the spin out of AstraZeneca. And now they're going to grow dramatically with a brand new building. And I was just talking to somebody, they're going to add another 80 people in the next couple of months. So those things are new dynamics, which I think are strong signals for our region. We're starting to attract people from outside inside. And some of those have needed some of those manufacturing capabilities that we said 
it wasn't one of our strengths in the past. The area that still needs the most work is VC. Um, you know, we, we don't have resident major VC firm, a number of m- resident VC firms in our backyard. That's why we try to do this investment conference uh, every year. We need to import other people's money for the companies. And as you mentioned, our Celix has done a good job. There's been a number of other companies that have done Cartesian's done a very good job. There's a number of other companies have done some very good private financings over the years. Uh, so we're starting to attract other investors into our region. So when you say what the tr- what's the transformation been, we're getting more capital, we're getting more M&A, we're getting more IPOs for over the last two years into 2022, but everybody sort of hit a little brick wall in 2022. So we're no different than a lot of other areas in the country, but I think our foundation is stronger to build upon. And the other thing that really put us on the map was the warp speed program with BARDA. 40% of that almost $20 billion of warp speed money that went in around COVID-19 over the last three years came to Montgomery County, Maryland. And so a lot of people didn't realize how important we were with diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics in our region to help take care of this global problem. But they it's sort of, they sort of woke up when they saw the companies that were engaged in helping uh, address that pandemic in our backyard. So overall, Brett, a short-winded answer uh, is, is that I think we're in a much better position than we have been in the past. I think we're uh, our foundation is much stronger to build upon, and we're not as vulnerable uh, or dependent on just the human genome sciences or an AstraZeneca or Metamune like we were 15 years ago when we had two biotech companies. Now we have numerous companies here to spread the wealth around that are growing. And, you know, one of the things that's obvious is everybody's trying to grow right now. And we see a lot of people jumping ship from one company to the other company within our region which in a way it's a healthy sign for the region because people are growing, but it also says we need to uh, add more critical mass in employable people and do a little more uh, workforce development, education and training to meet the needs of the industry in our backyard. So I'll stop right there. Did I, did I cover what you were looking for? Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts, Rich. And I agree, you know, there's certainly a strength of talent here. Um, you know, definitely have the ecosystem, the, the space, um, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of talk around. Does, does it have the capacity? Do we have the lab space? Do, do we have enough capital coming to the region? I think every every region is looking for for more capital, and that's a matter of really continuing to promote the region as much as as much as we can, and and uh, look forward to being a part of that. And I think this, you know, the biohealth uh, innovation group is uh, doing a great job of doing that, putting it on the map, and uh, continuing to tell the story to attract that capital as investors to come down here, understand what. Uh, what technology is coming out of the local ecosystem and, and continue to build, build the uh, community. Yeah. It takes a village as you know. So it's a, we, we have a lot of people involved in that, but uh, thank you. And the other thing that I think is very interesting for you for a first time is you're going to be a judge at the seventh annual crab trap competition, which uh, for people who don't know what that is and people can come and watch it live at U.S. Pharmacopeia at 12 o'clock on September 21st. Uh, again, that's in Twinbrook, uh, where we identify five companies who get a chance to go for prizes. And I'll explain those in a second before prominent judges. And our broad j- judges are Brett with J.P. Morgan. We have Conley uh, with Alexandria Real Estate Ventures. We have Wilson Sonsini Law Firm, one of the premier law firms in the United States working on life science deals. We have Tedco, uh, we have uh, Virginia Bio involved, Sally Elaine from uh, J-Labs, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and then we have Ethel Rubin from National Institute of Health, Entrepreneur and Residence. So if you really look at those cadre of judges, whether or not you win that competition or not, just getting the visibility in front of J.P. Morgan and Alexandria and Wilson and Tedco and Virginia Bio and Alexandria, all these other companies is just unbelievable for these companies. So if you have not registered to be a competitor in the Crab Trap competition, there is still time. We're going to accept applications through the first week in September. So please do so. And Brett, Uh, This will be your first judging. But, you know, to be honest with you, we've done an analysis of the six past winners. And believe it or not, five out of the six were medical device companies. They weren't vaccine. They weren't diagnostic. They weren't therapeutic companies. 
And four out of the five came out of Johns Hopkins. The criteria uh, enables anybody in the United States or internationally. We're going to have some Korean companies who are applying uh, for this because we're working with a cohort of South Korean companies to uh, help them evaluate coming to the U.S. market. But it's going to be a very interesting competition this year. And I think for you as a first time judge, it should be very interesting for you as well. Yeah, I'm excited to participate, especially with the uh, strength of the the other folks on the panel: uh, Wilson Sinsini, Alexandria Tetco, Virgi- you know, Virginia Bio, and and J Labs. You know, really appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to it. You know, whether uh, you know these companies win, which uh, I think there's some some great prizes or not, it's a great way to certainly get the story out share updates um, for the company to both the folks on the panel, but as well as those in attendance. So great way to get additional exposure and a great event. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the prizes. I forgot to mention that. But basically, Wilson Sonsini is putting up $10,000 prize. Uh, Noble Life Sciences, a clinical research organization, will provide clinical research services to a winning company. If they don't need their specific services, they'll actually make a cash prize award to them. Uh, J Labs uh, is going to provide one year's residency to uh, one of the companies which has a significant value. They'll get a chance to select that company that they want to work with. And as a kicker, if the company happens to be from Montgomery County, <laughs> uh, Montgomery County is going to provide a, uh, a cash award to a Montgomery County company if they are one of the winners. So at the end of the day, there's over $50,000 in prizes monetarily or in services that will be available to the applicants and the winners. And that'll be the most we've ever had in our competition. So it, there, there's more incentive for people to apply. Uh, to try to win this prize this year than is in past years. And the other thing is it's in person. Uh, The last two years it was done virtually. It's not the same interaction when you have the entrepreneur standing on stage with the seven judges. But again, we're going to be live. Uh, The the presenters will get seven minutes to present. There's three minutes for Q&A. And within an hour, the whole competition is done. We have a winner. And it's neat to have that uh, live with an audience there watching uh, the presentations. Sounds like a great opportunity. So uh, be there or be square, right? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, So let's talk a little bit about the future. You're relatively new to this region. I'd like to know what some of your goals are for, you know, JP Morgan in the mid-Atlantic life science area. And then what do you see as really the the bigger goals overall for JP Morgan nationally and internationally in this life science sector as we go into the future? Yeah, I think starting from a high level, we certainly want to continue to establish ourselves and build on the strength um, in the healthcare space that we've we've continued to have over over the years. So continue to to bring that down and those resources down to as, as early stage companies as we can. Um, so you know, my goal in this region is really to dig in, um, get to know uh, the ecosystem. You know, personally, as much as I can on the company side or, or the other contributors um, in this ecosystem as well. And it's been it's been great to get to know as many people as I can uh, so far, but really want to be able to support companies and be you know the go to for for these early stage uh, life sciences businesses and really to to grow with them through their progression, you know, which I think we can support them through through their stages of, of growth up through you know strategic transaction or international growth. So, you know, it's a matter of building those relationships at an early stage and uh, providing value where we can. And what do the uh, great JP Morgan analysts look at uh, for the next three to five years in this industry? Yeah, I think, I think there's still going to be a, a ton of traction. There's a ton of innovation in the, in the, the life sciences industries. It's in general been a great, um, you know, very attractive to investors in general as a high growth innovation um, goes and, uh, you know, definitely serves the communities and, and huge unmet medical needs. So I think we're, you know, optimistic on the, on the industry in general. And so, you know, continue to see it as, as, a, as a good investment going forward. Well, this has been great to get to know you better. We've been talking with Brett Shealy, who's the Executive Director of Life Sciences for the Mid-Atlantic Region for J.P. Morgan. And Brett, is there anything that I forgot to ask you or you'd like to talk to our listeners about that you think uh, you'd like to close with? No, I think, uh, you know, anybody listening, I'm certainly glad to and open to having conversations, trying to be an additional resource where it may be valuable, um, hearing the story, uh, trying to loop in additional resources, again, where it's helpful and, and, and making introductions, again, where it, where it might make sense. So feel free to reach out. 
And welcome to the Biohealth Capital Region again. Thanks for being a sponsor and a judge and involved in our events coming up September 20th and 21st. And we look forward to working very closely with you, Brett. Thank you, Rich. Good talking to you. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 